All right, praise the Lord, everybody. Good evening. This is Brother Ron from Cross Connected, and this is Victory in Jesus. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about the altar. Um, and when the exiles came back from being in exile, when the Jews, Israel, uh, came back from being exiled, came back to Jerusalem here in Ezra 3, the first thing they did was build an altar before they even started building the walls, before they even started rebuilding the temple, they built the altar. And that signified that they was putting their faith and their trust in a common Messiah. In God, their faith and their trust was in Jesus Christ. But before we get started, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory, Lord. We, Lord, I pray that you will speak through us or speak through me this evening, Lord, that you will minister to each one of us, Lord, that you will quicken your word within us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So, like I said, Ezra 3, the exiles are coming back. They're restoring worship. And the first thing they do is rebuild the altar before they build the temple. They build the altar. Before they build the walls, they build the altar. And you're going to see as we go through these seven verses that they built the altar. They rebuilt the altar on that old foundation that was laid before. So let's go ahead and get started, if you will. All right, Ezra 3, verse 1. And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Now I'm going to go ahead. This is a short study note in my expositor study Bible that I have. And I'm going to read that to you for verse 1. The seventh month corresponded nearly to our October. It commenced with a blowing of trumpets and a holy convocation on the first day. And that's according to Leviticus 23-24, which was followed on the tenth day by the solemn day of atonement, and on the fifteenth day by the Feast of Tabernacles, or ingathering, which lasted until the twenty-second day, incorporating three festivals, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Okay? Now, Two great facts or points here that are brought up in Ezra chapter 3. And one, it speaks of the Bible, and the second is the atonement. It speaks of the authority of the body, or excuse me, the authority of the Bible. It speaks of the authority of the Bible and the necessity of the atonement. Hey, Brother Robert, good to see you, man. Love you, brother. Good to see you. So it speaks of two great points and two great facts. The Bible and the, and the atonement. The authority of the Bible and the necessity of the atonement. Now listen, back in these times, listen, we know from John chapter 1 that Jesus is the word. And faith at this time, Ezra and the leaders were trying to reestablish uh, worship and, and, and live right for God. You know, here, what faith was, their faith was kept in the Word of God as best as they could. They were trying to do everything according to the Word of God. The Word of God was the final authority and the only authority. To the believer, the Word of God is the only revealed truth. And I don't care what the preacher is or who the preacher is. If they teach a doctrine that doesn't line up with the Word of God, Throw that doctrine away and don't listen to it anymore. We go by the Bible, period. We don't go by what somebody else, and we need teachers, and understand that God has called teachers. But what we need is the Bible first and foremost, not somebody else's opinion that won't line up with the Word of God. Now, if it contradicts the Word of God, you got to take that garbage and throw it away, brothers and sisters. So the Word, listen, so for, for Israel at this time, the Word cleansed them from idolatry. Now, listen, even before they were in exile, the miracles, both the, the both the miracles and the wilderness, uh, failed 
to cleanse them from idolatry. Um, but once they went into exile and they discovered the word, the word of God, the spirit of God used the word of God to cleanse them, to remove idolatry from their lives. And this is what we're seeing here. God doing the work. He worked on uh, the king that had them in exile, turned them loose, and they were given a grant and allowed to go back to Jerusalem. But it was because they repented of their idolatry. With the reestablishment uh, of the altar and the daily sacrifices, it drew many Israelites to Jerusalem to at least be, not just to witness it, but to be part of it, to see what was going on. We're going to go on to verse 2. Ezra 3, verse 2. Then stood up Yeshua. And this is Joshua. This is a priest. This isn't Joshua, the son of Nun, who has the book named after him. Then stood up Yeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren, the priests, and, and, Zerah, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Now Zerubbabel here, he would have been, the Davidic line was cut off from ruling. But this Zerubbabel would have been in the Davidic line of kings. But it had been cut off because uh, I think it was Jeconiah had had a, a curse placed on him. And, and, and ended with him. And it says here, they did it as it is written or this is as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They were following the word. They were following um, God as best they could. So when the exiles returned to Jerusalem, the altar was built, like I said, even before the temple was built, even before the wall was built, which proclaimed the sacrifice, which proclaimed the sacrifice i.e. the cross, which the altar was a type of. Symbolic of the cross is what the altar was in the Old Testament. Was the foundation of all that Israel was. It is the same for us as believers. It's Christ and Him crucified. It is His sacrifice, His atonement, His redemption for us. His his finished work, His righteousness, everything we receive from God the Father comes to us through Jesus Christ and what He won at Calvary's cross, including not just the infilling of the Holy Spirit, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. Everything. There's no other way of victory over sin. There's no other way to walk in abundant life. There's no other way to be a to walk in the victory of being a Christian outside of faith in Christ alone and what Christ has won. It is that's what is childlike faith. Our faith is completely in Jesus and what Jesus has done. You know, it's the same for us as believers today that, that He is the foundation of all that we are as Christians, as all that we are as the church. You know, so again, you see they're following the Word of God as best they could. Now let's read verse 3. Ezra 3.3 3. And they set the altar upon His bases. <coughs> For fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon, thereon unto the Lord. Even burnt offerings morning and evening. You know, by the they were afraid of the enemy. And they offered these burnt offerings. They weren't putting their faith in a man, an army themselves. They weren't going to put their faith in the wall. They, they were going to put their faith in God and in a coming Messiah. Is what this all represents. Now listen. 
and they set the altar upon his basis. I want to read the study note here. It means that they placed the new altar upon the foundation of the old one, making it exactly to conform to it. The old ways, the old past, the only way. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the light, and the life. He's the bread of life. I mean, we need to get back to that simple, childlike faith, brothers and sisters. And, they, and it talks about, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries, and they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. The expositor study note reads this, proclaims the fact that they were placing their faith and confidence in the shed blood of Christ, making that their defense against the heathen. In fact, this is what the Lord told them to do. Thus, the daily morning and evening sacrifices had begun. I want to read a little, a little short paragraph out of the commentary, uh, Ezra 3, uh, verse 3. And I want to read a... There's a little thing I want to read out of here. And uh, this will make some of you mad um, because I'm going to use this commentary. Uh, and I don't care. This is the commentary. Uh, and I'm only going to read it because this piece, because I believe is biblical. And it's Brother Swagger's commentary on Ezra. And so I'm going to read it. I'm going to read well, it. Nine lines, two small paragraphs. Here it is. Being very, the same foundation, being very careful that the new altar was designed exactly as the old altar and that was pl placed exactly on the old foundation presents a lesson to us presently which must not be ignored. Unfortunately, the modern church has built its own altar, something other than the cross, and has another sacrifice than Christ. And by the way, I might add, as it has made its own foundation, which in fact is a bloodless altar, and as well, which will accept the foolish offerings of carnality. Next the way the church has gone. They don't they don't want to preach the blood. They don't want to preach the cross. And I'm talking about even uh, our Pentecostal churches. I want to tell you something, a, a, a fact about Azusa Street that you might not know. That the main message that was being preached at Azusa Street by William Seymour and the other people that were preaching was Jesus Christ and Him crucified was the cross, was the gospel. And matter of fact, William Seymour, before he was even baptized in the Holy Spirit, was praying for people and laying hands on people, and they were being baptized in the Holy Spirit before he even was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Check it out if you don't believe me. It's historical fact. So foolish altars, in order to gain victory, in order to, to overcome a problem or live for God, and here's some of these foolish altars that we have created in the church. And I want you to understand something when I say this. There is something that's as called demonic oppressions, and, and Satan and his minions will attack Christians. But born-again believers cannot have a demon spirit residing in them. There is no biblical evidence or truth to that whatsoever. So casting demons out of Christians, that's a fallacy. It can't be done. Now you can bind up an enemy attacking a Christian, but you can't cast a demon out of a Christian. The, the Holy Spirit is not going to let a demon spirit live in his house. And if you're born again, you the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And Christ abides in you, and you abide in Christ. The other foolish, if you will, another foolish office, um, 
altar of the church to try to gain victory. The self-esteem gospel. All based off of humanistic psychology. You, you know that. Here's what Paul said. As a Christian. Oh wretched man that I am. Who's going to save me. From the body of this death. All his good works. Were dung. Or filthy rags. Is what he said. There wasn't no building up his self esteem. He, he encouraged himself. And exhorted himself. In Christ alone. And, and, and he boasted. In, in the cross of Christ alone. Jesus Christ and him crucified. So the. the and here's what the scriptures would say of this self-esteem gospel, this humanistic psychology gospel that floods our churches, and it even floods our Pentecostal churches. James 3.15, and I'll just use three words from that verse, we call it sensual and devilish. Holy laughter to the extreme. That if you break out in holy laughter all the time, you're going to have victory over sin. The blessings of God are going to be poured out on you. And so on and so forth. And there's nothing about that in the Bible. That that's the case. There's only one day to deal with our wicked selves and sin. And that's Christ. And I'm talking to you too as a Christian. Another false altar in order to get something out of our lives, is the idea of breaking the family curse. I want you to understand something. The family curse is broken. Once you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're born again, the family curse is broken. The son is responsible for his own sins. Every individual is responsible for their own sin. The family curse was broke at Calvary. And once you put your faith in Christ and what he did at Calvary, the family curse is broken. Now here's another one. Uh, the cleansing stream. And that's writing down all your sins on a piece of paper. And you either read them to somebody else or you give them to somebody to read. And then they give the paper to you. And you rip the paper up in the, in the tiny little pieces and you stomp all over it. That that's going to free you from your sin and, and your guilt and, and give you victory. Listen, that's hogwash. Every bit of these things I'm telling you right now is hogwash. It's not biblical. Uh, the only answer for sin and the only way to walk in freedom and victory is by faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done at Calvary, which allows the power of God, the Holy Spirit, to move and operate in your life. You don't need a bunch of ritual, man-made ritual, to, to defeat the devil. Jesus Christ has already defeated the devil for you. Praise God, glory to God, hallelujah. And to run around trying to fight the devil in your strength is hogwash. I love you. I'm not trying to be mean or ugly to you. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Verse 4. Let me see. Ezra 3, verse 4. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required. So here's what it says in the Expositor Study Bible, the study notes. Presents the feast, which points towards and promises the millennium, when all Israel shall be saved. And it's written in 23.16, when it says, as it is written, and it presents the offerings for each day of the festival as carefully laid down in Numbers chapter 29, verses 13 through 38. You can go back and check them if you want to. So the Feast of Tabernacles is also known as the Feast of Booths, and the Feast of Ingatherings. It started five days after the Great Day of Atonement. And it lasted about seven days. 
Uh, and many of the people in Israel, they would dwell in booths um, or tabernacles, if you will, to remind them of their wilderness experience, that God brought them out of Egypt and led them through the wilderness and provided for them in the wilderness. And they came out of that, well, they didn't age. They all died in the wilderness, uh, the first group. But the Lord provided for them and brought them out of sin and brought them out of Egypt. Uh, verse 5, Ezra 3, 5. And afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated, and of everyone who willingly offered a free will offering Unto the Lord. Everyone who willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. Even, even in the Old Testament, you were supposed to give cheerfully and freely. You wasn't supposed to give under compulsion, un, under um, someone begging you. Listen, I'm going to tell you something else. If you're in a ministry that's not new in the work of God, not not seeing people get saved, discipled and saved, and, and preaching the word of God for you don't need to be given to that ministry. Stop giving. You're not getting spiritually fed there. You're getting spiritually malnourished if you're at a church that's preaching the wrong doctrine. That's just the fact, folks. So let's see where we at. Study note, first five. So the Lord allowed this. Wait, 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 wait. Where am I at? Three five. And willing offered a free will offering unto the Lord, and this pertains to those commanded in Numbers twenty eight eleven through fifteen, plus the offering up of sacrifices. Anytime such offerings were brought by individual Israelites. Going on to verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. And this shows that their faith was in the shed blood of these lambs, these sacrifices, which represented their faith was in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. The cross, the altar, the sacrifices, they were the necessity before the temple, before the walls. And that was according, and where did they get that from? From the Bible, they got it from the Word of God, they got it from the Holy Spirit dealing with Ezra and all of them as they studied the Word. I want to read one more thing out of the commentary here for verse 6. And this is what it says. All of this tells us that everything revolved around the altar. Some may claim that the Ark of the Covenant, which was situated in the Holy of Holies, was the most important. In the strict sense of the word, that would be true. However, it must ever be understood that the Holy of Holies cannot be reached unless one goes through the sacrificial system of the great altar, i.e. the crucifixion of Christ. If anyone tries to come to the Lord by any means other than by the shed blood of Christ, the scripture plainly tells us that the Holy Spirit will bar all access. You see that in Ephesians 2, verses 16 through 18. All right, let's keep on going. One more verse. Verse 7. They gave money also unto the masons and the carpenters and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon and to them of Tyre to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. Praise the Lord. Listen, this was all orchestrated by God. It wasn't orchestrated by them or Cyrus, but Cyrus gave them a grant, and they began construction, or they, they was going to begin construction of the temple. But before they built that temple, they knew in their spirit 
They knew in their spirit that they had to build the altar first. And the altar had to be the foundation of all that they were, of their walk. And it's the same today. It's the same today for you and me as believers. So when we as new covenant preachers preach the cross and Jesus, I mean Paul said, he came declaring nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He came preaching the gospel to Christians. See, he got saved. Listen, Paul got saved. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues. And tried to live for God by trying harder and keeping the law. And he was failing. That's what we read in Romans 6, 7, and 8, and especially 7 and 8, it tells you how to walk in victory. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So he's, in Romans 7, that old wretched man, that he was talking about doing things he didn't want to do. He, he was doing things he hated to do and didn't want to do. He was failing, and that is a Christian. Baptized in the Holy Spirit because his faith wasn't right at the time. He hadn't been given the meaning of the new covenant yet. But when he did, all that failure started falling away. All that torment started to fall. The, the abundant life, the overcoming life, the victorious life, the Christ-like life or walking christ light began for him. And it will begin for you and me if we place our faith just in Christ alone and what Christ has done and let the Holy Spirit do what he can do. And am I saying something bad about the baptism in the Holy Spirit? No, we need it to be a better witness. The Bible encourages us to go after it and seek it. But we receive it by faith. By grace through faith in Christ and what Christ has won for us. Listen, when those preachers start telling you, you, you need to go past the cross, you can't go further than the cross. Everything is built on the cross. And until you understand that, you're going to struggle. But guess what? Once you, once he's dealt with you, once you understand it, once he brings you back to your first love, glory to God, you can have joy unspeakable and full of glory in every circumstance. You can have peace that defies all understanding, even in the middle of the storm. And matter of fact, he, he don't promise you you won't have no storms, but here's what he, he does promise you. He'll be in the storm with you. He'll be bringing you through the storm. Thank you. God bless you. We love you. But remember, more importantly, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit love you. Amen. Be blessed tonight.